Um, the idea of stories in transit is that language itself is a form of knowledge, and that expression is one of the major pillars of a relationship to the world. Uh, Hannah Arendt made, wrote a marvelous thing in her book, The Human Condition, which came out in 52. Stories are a form of action, the way we insert ourselves into the human world. The ability to produce stories is the way we become historical. And I'd say that the emphasis there is on produce stories, because pr the, production of stories takes, the production of stories takes many forms. Um, Darwish's poem, The Country of Words, which I won't read out for reasons of time, um, has very, I've italicized some interesting passages. This has become a kind of anthem of the Palestinian diaspora, and also related diasporas that identify with the Palestinian exile and the Palestinian occupation and so forth. So it's not only a Palestinian poem, it's a poem about the nature of being displaced and of being in relation to another place where you find yourselves. And what's interesting is the linguistic points that he makes in the carriages of the Psalms we travel, in the tents of the prophets we sleep. We came out of the words the gypsies speak. We measure space with a hoopoe's beak, the hoopoe being the fable bird of the, of the Arabian Nights. Um, which brings messages, a speaking bird, magic bird, which brings messages to Solomon and brings him knowledge, brings him wisdom. So I, so I see, see that as the ground of our, of our project. It also relates to something that Rowan Williams brought up yesterday, which is the relationship to the, to the environment, and the, not only just the natural environment, but the built environment, the, the place. One of the important functions of language is to relate not only to each other, but to relate and own the place we live in. And so one of the, we'll see, we're here later, that walking and owning the place by actually exploring it has become one of the methods we use to gather material to create stories. And that relationship to place, the use of language to name, relates to something very important and actually in some sense is almost early modern, it's kind of pre-early modern, but, and that is the law of sanctuary, which held, which held writ, which had held writ in this country for over a thousand years, um, before the Anglo-Saxons, all the way through to when Henry VIII abolished it, in the interest of something which Rowan also mentioned, which is the state, the state, the power of the state, surveillance, control of information, and so forth. It was abolished by Henry VIII because it contravened his idea of central control. But the important point from, the point from stories, relevance to stories, is that uh, sometimes sanctuary takes the, the shape of a stool and, and this, is an imp this is a place which you own by naming it as a sanctuary. There, is no, there are no fortifications, there are no armed guards, there is no door. You simply sit on the fridstool or seize the knocker, which is on a door, and that act, that, that, uh, that act, which is a kind of um, linguistic and gesture combined, is sufficient to hallow the place as a place of safety. Now that seems to me to be an excellent paradigm for what stories do. Stories will name and change and transform the experience and the actuality of where we are by the way they approach them, those places. I came across in Arabic that the root of the word for watering, rawa, is the same as the root for storytelling. A rawi is a storyteller. And to rawi, to ra or whatever the verb is, is to water. So here you have a case that irrigation, the, the absolute essential in a dry country for any kind of fertility or survival, is the same wo root word. This is a deep insight into what stories can do. Sicily, not only the central hub of the Mediterranean and the receiver of so many arrivants from um, all over the world, in fact, and many from Bangladesh arriving, as well as from Africa and, and the Middle East, um, has been uh, this crossing, cross point. We heard that yesterday as well for, for, for a long time. But it also has, a tra has traditions related to the Punjabi traditions we were hearing of the Kissa, um, and these sort of worldwide traditions of telling stories in the street. But what's again key in relation to stories in transit is that these, while these are verbal methods of expression, they are not only verbal, they are gestural, they are artistic, they are s musical, they are sonic, they are in, any, in many, many forms of expression. And Sicily is particularly rich in these m methods of storytelling. There's a very, very deep, long tradition 
of puppetry, which have, again tell stories with words, but very few words. Um, it has the, the stories that have lasted since the you know, early Middle Ages. The Song of Roland, one of the earliest poems in French, as you know, survives on Sicilian caretti in the street, um, telling the stories of the great paladins, Orlando and Rinaldo, and there is a relationship with those stories of clashes between Moors and Christians in the Middle Ages and what is, of course, happening in the world today. Um, and, but above all, the main principle is that we try to bring together people who have, as was mentioned about the Punjabi um, immigrants as well, who have not actually been together before. This is a kind of newly formed community. And as you see from that map, which is in one of the cafes we use, um, they come from absolutely everywhere. And the stories that we try to develop and foster, dramatize, animate in different ways, are not primarily the stories of the individual constituted self, as in the Western modern tradition of fiction. We try to collect plural voices in forms that are principally fable, allegory, fairy tale, myth. And that's for a reason, that the witness statement is key to the whole asylum process. And it is very familiar to the Arivans. And it has a sort of coercive and legalistic context. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't go for, su for subjective stories. But that there is a freedom, a freedom of playfulness, a freedom from the necessity to bear true witness, which is what the legal emphasis is. There is a kind of improvisatory joy that can emerge. So I'll end with a quotation from a poet, Andrea Brady, um, which I think is pertinent to this, which is artistic remembrance spurs the drive for the conquest of suffering and the permanence of joy. As I think everyone in this room knows, it is possible to enact a tragic experience in such a way that it, 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 the experience is alleviated not only for the teller, but also for us, the receivers, and for the community who hears it. We, we just, so i just show you a few more pictures. Um, this was the Epic of Gilgamesh, which we started with, and they made this marvelous boat. So the idea is that the personal experiences feed into the general. Okay. Um, good morning. Uh, thank you for kindly inviting us to come here and introduce um, Jokarenda Vaya Stories in Transit. I am originally um, a lecturer <laughs> in English at the University of Palermo, but actually I spend some of my time willingly as Jokarenda driver, interpreter, <laughs> and today I'm here uh, mostly, I would say, as Dean's interpreter because he can, can understand some English, but <laughs> He has some troubles expressing himself in English. So uh, in a few minutes, he'll be speaking in Italian. I know many of you understand uh, Italian, so it's nice for you to be able to understand directly what he says. But for the others, I'll translate something. But uh, before we move to that, um, I'd like to say a few things on stories in transit and my involvement in the project. Um, Marina Werner. Um, initially asked me uh, to help her organize a conference in Palermo, I think it was 2014, 2015, when we began thinking of organizing a conference on storytelling myth in Sicily, which seemed <laughs> an appropriate place uh, to do that. While the political and social situation in Italy uh, and the emergency of migration starting being a, a problem and also in some occasions Marina was asked to talk about, she chose to talk about migration and she decided to uh, put these two ideas together, a conference on orality, migration, uh, and so we began organizing a conference and then we happened to organize a part conference, part workshop in Palermo in 2016 and from this very first um, events, the first in Oxford and the other in Palermo in uh, September 2016, we developed, uh, thanks to the Metabolic Studio, a whole project with several workshops. And these workshops were successful, 
in spite of being maybe chaotic because of creation, because they could be develop, developed with the help of many artists. Uh, we have some representatives here, story, storytellers, mus musicians, poets, but I think that uh, something which made it unique is the contribution of students in Palermo who uh, attended a school for dropouts. These were students mostly coming from West Africa, some from um, Bangladesh, just a few from Syria, who arrived on these terrible boats, dinghies, and went, spent time in Libya, so went through all the terrible things that happened there. And uh, at, we, we thought it would be, you know, a bit weird uh, to think about storytelling, to draw them, to draw people who had suffered a lot into telling stories. We thought we might be a problem because we might work on personal levels, you know. But actually, we found people who were willing to be active in the storytelling activities. We found people who loved telling stories from their cultures. We found people who wanted to share their knowledge, their experience, but not, their ex not only their experience of migration. Some people in the end ended up talking about migration. Jokerenda uh, is this associ association Dean uh, is going to tell us about, was born on the second, I would say, on the second event we organized in Palermo, when Dean and other students from the school, Magasuba Ibrahim, walked to Marin and me saying, we like the idea of storytelling as a means for getting to know each other, to getting to know people here in Palermo, and to make our culture, our different cultures, known in Palermo. So we would like to contribute, we would like to use what you know, we can do. Uh, Dean said, I can, I'm a tailor, I mean, I can uh, be a tailor. Some, uh, some other person said, I can be a carpenter. So we can make objects, we can make games, and we want to use storytelling um, to spread this concept of jokerenda. So I think Marina was <laughs> willing and she found the means to start funding uh, Jokerenda as an association. Uh, Jokerenda is now about to become uh, what in Italy we call a social business um, because they found more funding in Italy as a, to become a startup really. So this thing is growing and it all started within Stories in Transit and it also started because of the generosity of many artists. Mm, I, w I can't add anything more now, <laughs> but maybe later if you, you want we can chat a little because I want to leave more space to, to Dean um, now. And first of all, I think, devo mostrare il video. He would like to show a video, a very short presentation of Jokerenda. Buongiorno a tutti, eh, io mi chiamo Dean, vengo della Guinea Conakry, sono in Italia da due anni e mezzo. Prima quando sono arrivato eh, mi dispiace che oggi non sto parlando in inglese perché io la mia lingua è francese. Quando sono arrivato in Italia non parlavo manco ciao, non sapevo salutare nessuno ma in questi due anni e mezzo e sono riuscito a comunicare in italiano. Uh, good morning everybody. Uh, I am Dean. <laughs> um, I come from Guinea, Conakry, from the Republic of Guinea. I've been, uh, in, I've been living in Palermo for three years mm -hmm. and when I got there I couldn't speak a word of Italian. Um, but I have been able to learn. I'm sorry that today I'm speaking in, uh, in Italian and not in English, but at least I've learned in Italian, I can speak that. Eh, prima di tutto, ringrazio tutti quanti. Ringrazio quelli che mi hanno invitato qui oggi, eh, perché 
da noi si dice quando una persona è qui davanti a voi per poter esprimere c'è stato tanto lavoro ci sono state delle persone che hanno lavorato notte e giorno per rendere questo possibile vi ringrazio tutti quanti um, first of all I would like to thank all the people who have been involved in the organization if I'm able uh, to be here and talk to you it is because many many people have worked day and night to make it possible so we uh, I thank you for this ok eh, dopo questo noi eh, quando siamo arrivati in Italia abbiamo iniziato la scuola, tanti di noi avevano studiato nel loro paese ma hanno dovuto ricominciare da zero per poter andare avanti. Io penso che oggi siamo qui e questi giorni a quelli che ho sentito eh, stiamo parlando sull'immigrazione, ma io penso che l'immigrazione è una cosa che chi non ha vissuto sulla sua spalla è come sta sognando che, che cosa vuol dire immigrazione perché la differenza tra quello che qualcuno ti ha raccontato e quello che hai vissuto è, è che chi ha vissuto un'esperienza è come raccontandoti questa esperienza è come stai rivivendo a quello che hai vissuto ma invece chi ha sentito solamente da qualcun altro è come è un sogno, è un sogno gli viene come eh, questo è possibile o no e quindi gli viene come un sogno. Um, when we, Dean and the others from Jacaranda arrived to Palermo, they had to start school again from zero because they didn't have i should say I didn't have, we didn't have the papers. So we had to start again as if we were kids, you know, <laughs> little kids, because we didn't have the papers, although we had studied already in our countries. And uh, uh, Dean says, um, I understand that uh, this conference, uh, all the people here are inter interested in migration, however, It is important to stress, to emphasize, that when one speaks about migration experience, it is impossible to fully understand one who's talking about the migration. Because when you listen to it, it's like a dream, it's not real. And the person who's telling you about his or her immigration experience relives it every time that he or she tells the story. But the other person who's listening can't fully understand. They only perceive it as in a dream. Oggi la cosa che vediamo, che sentiamo eh, sulla media è che i problemi più grandi che possono esistere è l'immigrazione. È come se fossi immigrare un crimine. Normalmente ognuno di noi se torniamo un po' indietro siamo dei immigrati tutti quanti perché prima di venire qua dove eravamo e dopo di qua tanti di noi e immigrare è una cosa naturale, reale che ognuno deve fare lo dobbiamo fare tutti quanti andare oltre del nostro paese dove siamo nati cresciuti perché se io vivo dentro di questa sala conoscerò solamente questa sala. Invece se esco qui fuori vedrò qualcos'altro che non avevo visto quando c'ero qui dentro. Quindi è una cosa che chi non ha fatto è molto importante andare oltre, vedere un altro mondo. Nonostante ci sono vari tipi di immigrazioni, ci sono immigrati che partono perché vogliono andare, visitare, vogliono andare da un altro paese per lavorare, ma ci sono persone che sono costrette se non vanno la loro vita è finita. Today uh, on the media the worst problem seems to be migration. People keep talking about migration as the worst problem ever. But uh, this makes it appear like a crime. It looks like uh, The media want to show that migration is a crime. 
But if we look back, uh, we are all migrants. We all need to move, to move beyond our environment, our world. If we stay in one single room all our lives, we will never get to know the world. So it is important to go beyond. It is important to get to know uh, the rest of the world. And then I'll see pass it over to Allora, io la cosa che riguarda immigrazioni, eh, vi posso dire una piccola esperienza che io ho vissuto, poi arriverò a parlarvi di quello che stiamo facendo ora. Eh, io ho passato del de dal deserto, che non avevo mai visto prima, e poi sono stato in Libia, un paese che nessuno può immaginare eh, come si vive in Libia. La situazione in Libia è una cosa che non si può raccontare. In più ho attraversato il mare. Ma la cosa più importante da, rit da ritenere, chi sta andando per piacere ha paura di andare. A un certo punto si ferma. Ma chi sta andando perché non ha un'altra scelta Nessuno lo può fermare. Andrà fino in fine, alla fine. Some people just decide to move to another country. They migrate because they have a choice. Others are forced to leave their countries. In my own experience, the experience I lived, I had to travel through the desert, which I'd never seen before. I was in Libya. Um, and it is an experience that you cannot tell. What people live in Libya is, um, is impossible to say. Um, and then I went across the sea because I had no other choice than to do that. Non lo so se ti ricordi, ho detto. Eh, ho detto che la persona che ha che viaggia per scelta si può fermare ma una persona che viaggia senza scelta che non ha la scelta a quella persona nessuno lo può fermare andrà fino in fine o fino a quando muore ma non può tornare indietro the person who travels because uh, he or he has a choice can stop whenever they think it is fine to stop. But a person who is forced to travel to leave his or her country can't stop until the journey is over. It's either go uh, or, or perish. And the journey will continue uh, even till death because they have no possibility of going back. So they need to go ahead. Gracias. Ora torno noi come Joker e quello che facciamo. Non vi posso raccontare le nostre storie, tutti quanti, la maggior parte dei ragazzi di Joker e sono immigrati. Siamo incontrati a Palermo, siamo conosciuti a scuola e abbiamo partecipato eh, al, a, al workshop di Marina Warner, che è Story in Transit. Ma prima di questo noi abbiamo visto tante cose in Palermo. Le cose che abbiamo visto è che Palermo è una città molto bella, molto ricca, ma mancava alcune cose. Ci sono alcune cose che mancavano in queste città, come la vera solidarietà. Perché il problema di oggi, noi parliamo della solidarietà, ma io penso che non è la vera solidarietà, perché la solidarietà vera è che è volere qualcuno come vuoi te stesso. Ma se oggi ti chiudi, ti saluto, non mi rispondi, ma che tipo di solidarietà è? Come possiamo comunicare se rifiuti il mio saluto? Sei ricca, sei tutto, ma c'è qualcosa che non va. La comunicazione comincia per saluto. Quando ti saluto, non aspettare di conoscermi prima di rispondere. 
ci dobbiamo rispondere per poter comunicare. Now, um, as Jokerenda is concerned, um, I can't tell the stories of all the members of, of Jokerenda, but uh, I can tell you we met in school and we became friends, and we all took part in Stories in Transit workshops organized by Marina. Um, of course, we, we all decided to study because it was important to grow uh, in that community, so to um, get all the titles we couldn't take with us because we wanted to, to grow and have a position in that society. Um, but as we uh, you know, went along our life in Palermo, in Italy, in Europe, we saw that there was no solidarity that people, you would meet people on the street and they would, you would say hello and they would not return your greetings. So we started thinking of how can we share solidarity if people don't grant us the opportunity to get to know them. If people just don't say hello, people may, might be well off, rich, uh, and they are fine, but they don't give us the opportunity to get to know them. They refuse the greetings. Io penso che l'offerta più grande che possiamo offrire ognuno di noi è sorridere per qualcuno e farlo sorridere. È l'offerta più grande che possa esistere, secondo me, che ognuno di noi può sempre offrire. Sorridiamo, facciamo sorridere qualcuno, lo salutiamo con un sorriso e lo facciamo sorridere. I think the greatest gift that one can give to another person is a smile, is to greet someone with a smile and make them uh, smile and laugh. Allora, noi, vedendo la città in cui stavamo vivendo, analizzando su vari punti, Abbiamo visto che ci sono tante, tante cose positive, ma ci sono anche tante cose negative. Allora abbiamo cercato di creare dei giochi cooperativi, perché abbiamo pensato come entrare eh, su integrazioni. Diciamo, tutti parlano là di integrare, di fare integrazioni. Ma per fare integrazioni ci vuole la comunicazione, qualcosa che può unire la gente. Non puoi chiamare ogni volta una conferenza, venite a fare una conferenza, e poi, ma in una conferenza non tutti possono comunicare tra di loro. Invece, noi abbiamo visto su questo e abbiamo pensato di creare dei giochi che sono giochi cooperativi che non si può giocare da uno solo, che può coinvolgere tutti, ognuno fa parte, Diamo a parola a ognuno, non importa da dove vieni e chi sei. E quindi partecipare ai laboratori che fanno giocherenda ti permetterà di comunicare, ti permetterà di conoscere altre persone, ti permetterà di giocare, di condividere, dire quello che pensi liberamente, senza essere giudicato. E per questo oggi, in questo momento, abbiamo creato questi giochi cooperativi che vi farò vedere tra poco. Yes, um, so uh, seeing, analyzing the situation that the city we were living in uh, was, we saw that there were many good uh, things going on, but also some negative aspects. Everyone keeps talking about uh, community making, integration, but we saw that it was impossible to get to know each other because there was no communication. Uh, we were often invited to conferences to talk about our experience, but people didn't really communicate. So we decided uh, to uh, create some cooperative games, some cooperative storytelling games, uh, which we used during meetings so that we could actually work on community uh, building and binding. Oggi, grazie a quelli giochi che abbiamo creato, in Italia, non lo so qua, ma dicevano gli immigrati rubano lavoro agli italiani. E per questo gli italiani allora 
a quelli che sono ignoranti, perché non sono tutti ignoranti, ma ci sono ignoranti, credono questa cosa. Credono che il problema di Italia tutto quanto è l'immigrazione. Invece noi abbiamo creato questi giochi cooperativi che permettono di creare un lavoro. Oggi sono un lavoro, prima siamo partiti in due, oggi siamo in dodici. In questi ragazzi, e otto di questi ragazzi hanno avuto l'opportunità di fare un tirocino formativo che gli permette di trovare un lavoro. Alcuni hanno dei contratti di lavoro grazie alla Fondazione Quelli Sud, l'abbiamo presentato, la nostra idea, abbiamo partecipato a questo bando, oggi ci hanno finanziato. Ci hanno finanziato almeno per 15 mesi per poter creare e progettare e vendere i nostri prodotti in Italia e in tutta Europa. E quindi è un'opportunità molto grande, invece di andare a rubare lavoro, come pensavano i politici, come Matteo Salvini, e oggi noi offriamo lavoro. Ci sono tanti ragazzi, lavoriamo con cinque associ grandi associazioni in Europa, non soltanto in Sicilia, come Libera Palermo, Antimafia, CSIE Palermo e Fab Lab Palermo, Associazioni SEND, Associazioni Senegalese, tutti questi stiamo lavorando insieme. Stiamo lavorando insieme per poter creare queste imprese sociali di giocherenda. Oggi giocherenda vuole diventare un lavoro che permetterà a tanti altri ragazzi di poter lavorare. Non abbiamo immaginato di prendere il nostro curriculum, di andare a chiedere lavoro a un'altra persona, ma con la creazione che abbiamo fatto, oggi, grazie a quello, noi lavoriamo dentro giocherenda. That was very long, <laughs> but I'll try and, and sum it up. <laughs> so Dean was saying that thanks to the games that Jacaranda created, um, they're trying also to, you know, modify that stereotype that in Italy is largely believed that immigrants steal jobs. Mm, and Dean was saying people were, were a bit, oops, we're a bit ignorant, really don't understand uh, immigration. They think people go there and steal jobs. But they decided to create an opportunity for jobs, and they got this funds, uh, funding from Fondazione con il Sud, um, uh, which uh, is, is allowing them a three-year pr uh, project with 15 months paid, paid stages and contracts and initially there were just two uh, people involved in Jokerend and now there are about 12 of them. There are also some associations and local um, you know, copy centers who get work because of Jokerenda. Not only of course, but you know, they're contributing to, lo contributing to local e economy. And they are working with associations which are active all over Europe, like Cesia, I don't know if the pronunciation in English and the acronym is the same. Um, okay. eh, allora, oggi eh, sono qui in quei giochi, come che i tempi sono pochi, non posso prendere tanto tempo perché vedo che abbiamo tanto lavoro da fare, io mi fermerei tra poco. Ma, eh, vi posso dire a Palermo in questo momento non lavoriamo solamente con l'immigrazione, con gli immigrati per farli sia integrare eh, con, tra loro, lavorare sull'integrazione tra gli immigrati con gli italiani, ma lavoriamo pure per gli italiani che vivono nelle quartiere più belle e nelle quartiere più brutte. Quando vedete qua sul video noi siamo stati da Delolio, una ditta di moda, dove abbiamo fatto la formazione per i dipendenti, a quelli che lavoravano per lui, dove c'erano eh, 60 persone che lavoravano in queste aziende. Siamo andati come Giocherenna per fare la formazione, come si può collaborare nei luoghi di lavoro, come si lavora in gruppo, come la gente, non facciamo le attività solamente per i bambini, ma facciamo le attività pure per le persone adulte. Lavoriamo con le quartiere 
che sono molto, diciamo, la gente pensa che sono quartieri più pericolosi a Palermo, ma noi giocherendo ci andiamo. Ci andiamo, facciamo dei laboratori a questi ragazzi per dare le speranze. Vi racconto una mia esperienza che ho fatto con questa ragazza. Ok. Um, so, um, I would like to say that we don't have much time, so uh, we can go and describe all the games here. You saw some pictures, but later there will be a table so that you can come close and see all the games. And of course, in the second session, we will be playing one game, The Wheel of Wishes. So you'll be able to practice that <laughs> and get to know it. Um, but I would like to say that we don't only work with kids. Uh, we work in schools, of course, but we work with, we work with adults. Uh, we work with adults in bad areas, districts of Palermo, which are renowned as dangerous places. Uh, we work with posh, we've worked with some posh um, brand and fashion shop in Palermo, the Loyo, you can see some pictures, uh, trying to work with them on teamwork and uh, these ideas of uh, working together. But I'd like just to conclude to tell you uh, a story of one of the workshops we held in one of the poorer areas of Palermo. Eh, quando sono arrivato a fare questo eh, laboratorio, c'era una ragazza che diceva stava facendo quinto anno, dice che questa volta se io non supero quinto anno, il mio padre è morto, vive con mia madre, non abbiamo tanto opportunità, io abbandono la scuola. Quindi avevo dei sogni, ma ho preso tutti i miei sogni, li ho buttato in un secchio, un ceschio, li ho buttato fuori perché ho capito che non posso realizzare mai i miei sogni. Allora ho detto, senti, eh, magari non di prendere esempi sulle altre persone, ma prendo esempi su me stesso. Ti posso dire, tu hai perso il tuo padre. Io non ho padre né madre e quindi magari io la mia situazione diciamo è peggio. E poi tu vivi nel tuo paese, io non vivo nel mio paese. Sai quanti ostacoli io ho dovuto superare? Non ho mai mollato, non sono mai tornato indietro. Perché sai il mio sogno? Tu vuoi diventare un artista? Ora l'hai abbandonato? Io voglio diventare presidente. E allora io penso che il mio sogno è più grande, no? perché diventare Presidente della Repubblica è più grande di diventare solamente un artista. Ho detto io lotto ogni giorno per raggiungere il mio obiettivo e quindi mai tornare indietro, mai molare. La ragazza ha cominciato a piangere e è venuta a abbracciarmi. Alla fine ha continuato la sua scuola, oggi si è laureato. Siamo in contatti ancora e lavoriamo insieme, diplomati. Ok. Um, I was um, working in a workshop in uh, Zen, which is a very poor area of Palermo, and there was this girl who told me, this year, if I fail school again, she was in the uh, last year of high school, I'm going to throw all my uh, dreams out of the window because my father is dead. And, you know, I think I have to take uh, a responsibility for myself, for my mother, and so on. So Dean said, you know, you shouldn't measure uh, your experience, your, your, your future just on your own experience. If you think of me, I've lost my father and mother. You live in your country, I had to leave my country, and I've never wanted to, you know, to drop all the things I was fighting for. I keep fighting every day. So you should fight too. You should not compare yourself uh, to people who are like you, but to people who have lost maybe more than you. There are always people who have more, but there are people who have less than you do. Uh, and this girl decided to actually go on. She finished school, and now you know, she's going on in the life they're still in touch. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, when a group of us arrived in Palermo in uh, autumn of 2016 to work with a group of young migrants on storytelling, we came, of course, with various plans. I came with ideas for uh, writing workshops, as I teach writing, 
bringing along things that had worked well in the past, but I quickly found that my well-laid plans had to be abandoned as we gave ourselves to the spirit of the moment and found that the boys at this stage, they were almost exclusively boys on the first visit, taking us often in different directions. We sometimes ended up singing rather than writing or playing musical instruments together, uh, scratching violins and chanting. We had to adapt also to the polyglot situation where words from all sorts of languages could end up in the melting pot. And we gave ourselves too to the possibilities of non-verbal sounds and of onomatopoeic shouts. One thing we discovered quickly was that the students often had remarkable storytelling abilities and all that was needed to set them off was to give them a little space and a little confidence. One of the things I had expected to make use of uh, when I arrived in Palermo was the work of Ulipo, whose most famous member was Georges Perec. Um, partly because much of Ulipo's work has a playful and game-like quality that makes it very accessible. Writing without the letter E, for example, or thinking of things that are yellow and working from there. At moments I felt that imposing Ulipo on a group largely from Africa smacked of aesthetic colonialism, so I let this lie in favour of other approaches, but eventually on a subsequent visit I did find a space for some Ulipian work which chimed in unexpected ways with the instinctive interests of the wider group. For one thing, the repetitive structures and refrains of traditional stories have much in common with Ulipo, who have long been interested in repetition. For example, in a writing method they refer to as a kick start, as used in Georges Perec's uh, memoir, Je me souviens, where every entry begins with the words, I remember, and it goes on for a very long time. At one moment, we found ourselves working on some scenes from Gilgamesh, and my group took on a scene where Gilgamesh, after he has made friends with the wild man in Kidu, shows him round his city. All I had to do was to give them the kickstart, which went, in the city, Gilgamesh showed Enkidu, and they were off, quickly improvising a scene which went something like this. In the city, Gilgamesh showed Enkidu all the animals. He showed him the lions, the tigers, the elephants, and the giraffes. In the city, Gilgamesh showed Enkidu the beautiful gardens. He showed him the eucalyptus trees, the mangoes, the purple flowers, and the birds. In the city, Gilgamesh showed Enkidu the statues with their eyes of emerald. He showed him all the traffic hooting and spitting out fumes into the air. In the city, Gilgamesh showed Enkidu all the DJs. One of the boys worked as a DJ at night. And they danced through the night until dawn. As we performed these lines, others joined in, making noises and adding lines of their own. And some people started to drum along and to scratch away at violins and spin plastic tubes in the air to imitate the sounds of elephants. It was one of those moments I will never forget. Whether it was an accent or a piece of synchronicity or something directly influenced by this kind of work, I can't say. But as the Jocarenda started to work on their own storytelling games, partly with a view to creating game objects which they could sell to support themselves, some of the things they came up with, at least to me, had an Ulipian flavour. Ulipo have long been interested in what they call combinatory literature, stressing the combination and recombination of storytelling elements in the generation of stories, something which will be familiar to anyone who has worked on traditional tales where combinations create the warp and woof of the stories. For Ulipo, this is distantly connected to the writing machine we encounter in Gulliver's Travels, an object, of course, which is um, an object of swift satire. One of the games the Jocarenda came up with, which we'll look at later, a play later, Wheel of Wishes, was reminiscent of these machines for generating stories, and it consisted of wheels which could be turned to choose different characters, jobs, backgrounds, etc. Subsequently, I can see other echoes of Ulipo and different activities which have emerged more or less spontaneously, such as the storytelling cloak 
At first sight, nothing could be more traditional, but here the pockets are used to fill with words of colours, characters, action words, and so on, which are then picked out at random and combined into stories. The method very closely resembles that used by uh, Raymond Queneau, uh, one of the founder members of Ulipo, in his brief book, uh, Exercises in Style, where he retells a tiny little story about an argument on a bus in 99 different ways. One of these he calls logo rally, or word game, and here a series of random words are thrown into the mix and have to be incorporated in the narrative. I'll finish by reading one very brief and very rough version of a single story created in this way using the storytelling cloak. Uh, this was made at Elephant West in May 2019. It's tiny, but it'll give you an idea of the sort of thing that can happen here. A centaur met a wood pigeon. A centaur met a wood pigeon, and they travelled through a water fountain until they encountered a school of fish. Eventually, they came to a house. And in the spring, when the wind was blowing in the right direction, they set sail in a dhow. They passed an orange tree, under which sat an ice cream man, whose ice cream waiters were snails. They sat in the oasis eating the ice cream, but were defeated by the sheer quantity and by the intensity of the flavour, which was trepidation. They leapt up and hopped about to help with their di digestion, then heard a great squeak coming from a red and white lighthouse. They were frightened. Thanks. Hi, I'm Joan Ashworth. I'm a filmmaker and animator and also former professor of animation at the Royal College of Art. And um, I joined this project. My main task was to introduce animation to the storytelling process. And I was very interested in what animation could bring to the particular project in this particular environment of working with uh, mig migrants or arrivants, as Marina prefers us to, to say. Um, so from the outset, we settled on making silhouette animation or cutout animation because it's a very direct way of working and people can pick up cutting out um, very quickly and moving things under the camera very quickly. And we set up um, a simple rostrum camera designed by one of the other artists in the group and so here you can see it on the left. It's a, a simple rostrum camera with a camera on top and a, a light box underneath and a simple, you can only just see it, a little piece of perspex. And so we had a mini multiplane on which to work. And it means you can have the figures separate to the backgrounds if you need it. And here you can see Dean uh, working on one of the early sequences. Um, we had a plan to collect leaves and flowers and other objects from around Palermo on one of the initial walks that we went on the first time I visited Palermo. <coughs> and the idea was to try and animate them under the camera. And you can see a, a design emerging here using some objects from Palermo, some spices from the markets here, um, a little bird being made. Um, And here's some of the cutouts that, that we made. And this is the bird in more of its detail. Um, we're also inspired by some of the shadow puppets that were in the Puppet Museum. And um, lots of the drawings that were made by the participants were very colorful. So our silhouettes seemed a bit too black and white. So introducing some translucent papers into the mix seemed important. So the main focus of the animation was to explore the story of the huntsman, um, which was told by Dean um, to all the group, and um, it was translated by Valentina. And then people responded. Maybe <laughs> and, um, and then it was, um, lots of people made drawings in response to the telling, and then we translated the drawing into animation. So on this piece, one of the drawings is made, and then we've used little pieces of carrot, dried carrot from the market, to act as the dream bubble 
in which more actions, what she's dreaming, can be shown. And you can see the scene in the film that we're showing after, at the end of our short introductions. So the story of the huntsman, um, it, it is, has other stories nested within it. There's two shorter stories nested in it. And this structure, as Marina tells us, one story inside the other follows the tradition of a thousand and one nights. And each mini story is used to reinforce the message of the major story, the bigger story. And uh, in this case, a message about not jumping to conclusions. Um, one of the, the nested stories is about a frail bird who's rejuvenated by a magical fruit. Um, and you'll see this in the film as well. But, and the second story, nested story is about a cat who's charged by a mother with being a nursemaid to a baby while she goes out to the market. And after Dean had told this story, participants made many characterful drawings in response to, to the story. And, and then these drawings, as they were adapted um, for the animation. And here's an expressive, characterful drawing of a scene from the cat story where the cat has saved the baby from a snake who's entered, entered the space. So we used, um, we used cutouts to interpret that drawing and um, Roger is going to talk a little bit more about the, the drawings in a minute. Um, but um, the idea is to try and get the atmosphere but still be able to move the figures, get the atmosphere of the drawings. Um, so also we needed to dramatise the oral story into something that could be visualised and acted out on the screen. So dramatisation of the cat and baby scene was discussed with the, with the storytelling group. Who would see the snake first, the cat or the baby? How should we show that the cat is caring for the baby whilst the mother is away? Perhaps the cat could sing a lullaby to show that he's caring. So working with the poet Phil, um, uh, the Aravants came up with a lullaby in French and English and decided to try out animating the lullaby words on the screen. Um, the Aravants have discussed with Phil how best to write the sounds that a baby makes when it cries, each language having its own way of expressing sound as text. And when the, when the snake enters the scene through the open window, the hissing, snaky sound is represented by an animated word, sheel. Um, Amadou, who was animating, who was animating um, this scene, naturally slowed down the speed of the word as it crossed the screen, and um, it adds tension to the scene. And when this piece was screened in the Puppet Museum, all the audience joined in with the sound of the snake. The text on the screen acted as an invitation to participate. So the interplay between um, the group of volunteer artists and the Aravants is very stimulating, I think, for all of us. Um, we're all improvising as we go. As, as, as artists didn't know each other before the start of the project, most of us didn't know each other, but we've been collected, curated by Marina to participate and contribute. Um, perhaps it's helpful that the process of animation points in some way to the future. It impatiently asks through the timeline, what happens next? The movement can help to imagine forward and that there is a future. And it's made me very aware during this project that the giving of attention to someone's creativity is very nourishing and that animation can be an intense form of visual listening. So thanks very much and thanks Marina for inviting me to take part in the project. Thank you. Well, I'm just going to um, enlarge a bit on what Joan um, has said about um, animation, which is a crucial part of the, um, the workshop. I, I'm a, I was a late arrival. I came only to the last of the Palermo um, sessions. Um, I found it incredibly enjoyable, I mean, and, and people were working together so fluently. <coughs> um, drawing, I mean, we've heard a lot about language and the difficulties of translation and so on, and they were 
people speaking many, several and many different languages in this group. And of course, drawing I'm in an ideal, in, in my mind anyway, it's a universal language um, and transcends these um, obstacles of communication. And to some extent, that was possible. Obviously, it's, an, it's, it's, it's a learned skill. And there were, t there were t teachers there, not only Joan, but uh, another couple of artists and illustrators um, to steer people. And um, we started on the first morning with a, what I thought was a very stimulating, liberating exercise, um, which was to wander through the streets of Palermo, um, picking up details and making little drawings of them. They might be <coughs> a um, little carved head above a lintel in a doorway or um, a piece of especially um, provocative or amusing graffiti. Um, and we just strolled as a group, and or several groups, we were divided up into groups, and um, Palermo lends itself to this kind of um, uh, drift through the streets, um, and people didn't, weren't, didn't appear to be tempted to pull out their cameras. They had their paper, and um, they were willing, and, and obviously there were yeah, there's some devices for, um, simple devices for framing a, um, a situation which could then be drawn. Um, and it was not an exercise where we were then going away and having a crit about it, but it was um, just a way of getting everybody involved and um, visualizing and attending to, to their environment, everybody in the same sort of way. Um, that was the beginning um, of this. Now, there were, as well as the animation, there were, because there were productions being prepared that they included um, images, and we've got one over here, in fact, an example of this of the sort of storyboard that was produced um, in the tradition, really, but both of the, uh, the pictorial traditions of Palermo, uh, the time-honored tr uh, traditions of itinerant storytellers around the world who illustrate their stories to give a sense, you know, to anchor them and to um, hold everybody's attention. So this was another level of um, picture-making that was going on. Here's, here's um, oh, this is back to Joan's animation, which you'll see in, in action, in the f short film, which we're going to show in a minute. Um, this is one detail. I think this, this young man, I, it, stru it struck me, as what, we were not there to kind of inter in, interrogate people and, and, and prize out of them their own particular personal stories, and quite often didn't hear anything about them. But actually, Amadou, who was behind this little bit of animation here, was... Very, very meticulous in his, his um, use of the scissors and cutting out silhouettes for the animation. And he mentioned to me, just in passing, obviously stimulated by this process, um, that his father had died when he was 10, um, and that was the end of his education. And this is the production, the beginning of the, the rehearsal for the production um, in the courtyard of this um, convent. And um, is that the same? Same uh, story, but yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and there were masks as well that we that we use, and you'll see all of the. Oh, sorry, uh, that's the end of my pictures. <laughs> sorry. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Um, in many ways, my entry point into this storytelling journey was very much the same as how I would approach any form of composition. Um, I have no background in sort of philanthropic work. I just compose. Um, and what in, in, in when we first arrived in Palermo, it was really expensive to take on an extra bag so I could take my fiddle. So I decided to buy a fiddle once I was in Palermo, went to the local music shop from the school we were working close to, said a little bit about the project, and they gave me a discount fiddle, which I then I left behind after our first trip, not really thinking that anything might come of this. And when we went back, this, this fiddle had become very important. Um, and the wonderful thing about a violin, it's a bit more culturally neutral than instruments like pianos. Um, and also sounds that I'm into, which is mainly noise and timbre, are also sounds that travel through history, and they also travel through culture, as do sounds of nature. Um, and so I suppose that was the recipe that I went in with, with this wonderful project. 
Um, and I was kind of sidestepping, really, because um, sometimes what we were doing with our um, uh, musicians, and perhaps we can have a slide to show them, was illustrating the story, but, oh, am I meant to do it myself? No, Sorry. I <laughs> Thanks. Um, and sometimes we were just um, listening together, and actually, um, what I found was with the way I worked, um, we never, I never suggested what we might do. We all had our fiddles, which were donated often by people from Cambridge. My mum lives in Cambridge and she put the word around that we needed some more fiddles to be bought. Um, and um, we would just start, or I would start by doing something like this. might develop into. And that sound, in fact, we used more than any other sound because it, was, it, it could become a rhythmic sound. It was a transparent sound. The wonderful thing about improvising, what I wanted to have in this project was a sense of shared hierarchy. You can only, it, it, this wonderful feeling about being in an ensemble where you have a role but you, you can't dominate because if you dominate you can't hear somebody else and that kind of collective creativity doesn't happen so much in storytelling because you often have one person telling the story and the others are um, uh, listening so I just wanted to get a bit between the cracks of that kind of form of communication and the other sound we've got can you show there's a yeah you see in in the left hand side the, the other sound and this com did come from the serpent we got very into doing glissandos <laughs> Because um, that's again a sound that you can make by yourself and it's a wonderful sound to compose with. And that was one boy wanting to know how to make this and he got a great glissando by the end of the day. Um, so that's all I wanted to say really. What I wanted to share with you today were two in, uh, instances of these workshops which profoundly affected me. One is, first of all, I'm a migrant myself, so I have a migrant experience, which I'm not gonna go into today, but in one of the workshops, we were doing the Epic of Gilgamesh, and we were divided in several groups. And one, my group, had to take the part where Gilgamesh has to go through the sea of death in order to get the plant of immortality or something under the water. And first of all, his boat had to go through this very rough sea and at one point in time he had to use his um, shirt to make it into a veil to uh, a voile, sorry, into a sail uh, to sail. And we were trying in my group to explain about the, um, that story in Gilgamesh and suddenly, completely out of the blue, one of the boys in the group, Ibrahim, started telling us the story of his crossing into the Sea of Death, into Palermo. And it was unbelievably touching, telling us how they had to, uh, how at the end the helicopters were hovering above their boat and how they were brought to the shore and all this stuff. And I kind of realized that my little migrant story, which was rather safe, quite harrowing at the beginning, failed in insignificance with the migrant stories that we were gathering in those workshops. And then the second little incident I'd like to share with you is, uh, and you will see it in the film, is the story of the genie of Palermo. As you know, I special, as you don't know, but I specialize in Middle Eastern myths and legends, and I adore genies. Genius is part of, of my storytelling. So when we did the genie of Palermo, we again took a group and we were walking, uh, I'm a words person, like Mahmoud Darwish said, words is my country. So we were taking the group and we were asking them just to take note of certain things that they see in Palermo, words. And all the words that we noticed in Palermo, like um, la donna alla finestra, the women at the window, or uh, graffiti, or things that we were noticing in the street made it into our list. And that list 
became a song, Il Genio di Palermo. And the way we constructed that song was me and a wonderful local musician from Palermo. I asked her, is there a, a song that everybody would recognize that we could actually engage the Palermitanos in joining with us? And she said, yeah, yeah, there is this very, very ancient song that is very typically Palermitana. So we combined that ancient song with a list that we had gathered on our walk to make it into Il Gigno di Palermo, which you're gonna see in the film. And that's all I have to say for today. Thank you. Now it's up to you to make up a story of how you will make your dream come true using, starting from this identity you've been given, your counter shows you what is your identity. There are several categories, age, um, gender orientation in some cases, the place you are in. How do you make your dream come true with the things you have, okay? And it is nice if when you tell your story later, you state where you started from and where you ended up. <laughs> or at least trying to describe it. <laughs> So we were an obstacle or? Is that an obstacle? The, bottle, yeah. the water bottle in the industry. Is that an obstacle? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the best of interest. But um, some of us are trapped in the water bottle in the industry. Uh, uh, no, I was thinking one, two, three. I think bottled water is the obstacle. Yeah. Bottled water. Yeah, yeah. Not everyone actually has to be in the shed. They're going to the big bottle again. Bottled water. It's modest, not doing it. much, I doing much it? more profoundly cut. <laughs> Our wish in this story is to abolish borders. One day, a very tenacious journalist was put in a prison in Kashmir because of his opposition work. He was first of all in a lone cell. But then suddenly, the people decided they should put him on the machines to make industrial jeans for Versace that show the crack of the bomb. <laughs> Working on these machines day after day after day, the poor man was absolutely exhausted. One night, he was asleep, he had a dream. He dreamt of an emu. The next night, he woke up and he saw an emu feather on his pillow. And the night before, he woke up and he saw another feather and another feather and another feather until the emu appeared to him in person in his cell and said to him, I'm the emu of India. I have unlimited feather to give you. What are you going to do about them? And the man said, I will make a cloak with 
those feathers and I will cover the whole world to try and erase the borders. Mm -hmm. And that's what the man did. Day after day after day, when he finished his shift, he would sit at his machine and put in all the feathers, multicolored feathers, black, white, green, blue, because they were magical unlimited feathers, not just emu colored feathers, to make the cloak. And when he finished the cloak, he covered the whole sky with it, and it looked like a sky whale. And then it gently fell down, down, down on the earth and erased all the frontiers between humans. Our words were sky whale, emu, sewing machine, and tenacity. There once was a man called Jim who was 100 years old and he'd been a successful gangster since the year of his birth, in fact the day of his birth. His parents he never knew but they'd imbued him mysteriously with a power of persuasion and it was a power that he held very dear to himself. He also had another great power which was the ability to jump very, very great and profound distances. Distances that perhaps you wouldn't consider distances. Perhaps you'd consider them more like time. And so Jim held this power very closely to him. His power of persuasion led him to speak with all the people of his village. People great, people small, people of all different colours, genders, ages. He didn't, he didn't worry. He spoke to everyone. And they all became his friends. But one day, something terrible happened. Jim jumped as he was wont to do a great distance and landed in the Amazon rainforest right in the center and was encircled by a great fire but this was no ordinary fire it was a fire that was once red and green and as we all know red and green should never be seen and so Jim was worried very very perplexed by this situation and it caused him to jump back to his home, back to Senegal. And he gathered up all of his friends, great, small, of all ages, all genders, and together they jumped back to the Amazon. And they found a man who some might describe as a wicked man, others might describe as a confused man. But he was called Bolsonaro, and he was a very fateful man. And he stood on the perimeter of the Amazon all around him were his disciples and they gathered all around the rainforest and they watched and they cackled as the green and the red flames grew higher. Jim distributed tactically all of his Senegalese friends and they all held hands with the compatriots of Bolsonaro. Jim travelled worriedly back to the centre of the Amazon. The centre was deep, it was far, and it was troublesome. But when he reached that centre, he used his last and final power. He jumped into the sky, into a great cloud above him, and he spoke in his beautiful, elixir-like, persuasive voice, and he asked the cloud to cry. And the crying was joyous, and the crying allowed the greens and the reds and the flames to cease and Bolsonaro cried and Jim smiled and he held hands with his friends and they jumped happily to Senegal forever. Our wish was to remove all plastic from the sea and we were a, um, a, a, refu a female refugee um, that was in the Egyptian sea. Say again. Our wish was to remove all the plastic from the sea and we were a female refugee in the Egyptian sea. So that was for, um, fortuitous. Uh, we were on a boat looking out to sea off the coast of Egypt. The boat began to transform, groaning. A trap door appeared, allowing us to see the ocean floor inhabited by deep ocean children. 
You can only hear them when you're in the sea. We, she, swam towards the mer children. They lead us, they led us to a pre-glitched TARDIS, which took the form of a plastic bottle. The kids didn't know whether they could trust us, so we made a sea feast. We brought them round. They told us that many mer kids had died because of plastic pollution, toxicity. This gave us all the more impetus to clear the sea of plastic. We promised to help them in all ways we could. Um, so that was as far as we got all together, but I think it was going to continue so that um, we would manage to fit all the plastic inside this, this TARDIS. So it was a pre-glitched TARDIS because it wasn't a police box. It could take the form of any place that it, environment that it ended up in. And all of the plastic bottles would manage to fit into that one plastic bottle, and then that last plastic bottle disappeared. Um, but we were also thinking about how we could use the TARDIS to go back in time to rescue all of the children that um, had been polluted by the toxic waste of plastic. Uh, and Okay, um, hi, so our story um, on the sheet that we were given, um, we had an aristocratic child um, from the UK but now the UK was totally desert. There was like no greenery and no water left. In fact, all of the water had been put into bottles by Nestle. Uh, the, wish, the wish was to put out the fires in the Amazon. And um, she explained our, our context. But we had, we had two obstacles, one of which she sort of mentioned. One was that one obstacle was, plastic, was water bottles. And the other obstacle was history. And we had two um, objects that would help us. Uh, that was a musical instrument and... A magic snorkel. Yeah. And a magic snorkel. Yeah. So our story begins with the child um, sort of in his aristocratic home in the UK. And he... Which Stump. has become a desert. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> if we haven't said already. And, and we realized that he had to undo his privileged hierarchy. So we wanted to use a, the musical instrument we thought could do that. And um, some members of the group came up with the idea that the musical instrument would be made out of wood from the Amazon. And then... The like the instrument would call out to him sort of from its box to like get him to forget his history and sort of call out its history yeah. to him. So the idea was sort of that it would sing it, it would sing its own history and that would be discordant with his own and so that would create a moment of like epiphany. Epiphany defamiliarization for him and then um, um, he would wander into the desert um, and he ended up finding in the desert uh, a kind of uh, fo fossilized magic snorkel because there is no more any water There's but no the water. snorkel must, must have been left behind from when there was water. Yeah, so and the snorkel is like magic and he puts on the snorkel to kind of go on the quest so that he can end up at the Amazon and put out the fires. And so the, the idea, we, we tried to think about what would be magical about a, a snorkel, and so we decided that a magic, a magic snorkel would actually take you, to, would help you to find water. So the magic snorkel um, took him, would take him to a body of water, um, which he could then use to help put out the fires in the Amazon. Honestly, we, we sort of ran out of time for yeah. the very last part, but... But it was really great, though, because we all sort of came together. It was very collaborative, and the ideas yeah. that we had were all sort of jointly agreed. So. Yeah, and, and we had, I think, somewhere some idea that maybe the musical instrument would also be a way of bringing, making his quest more collaborative and bringing people together, but we never quite worked out all the details of that.